So let's go ahead and start off with agenda bashing while people are writing themselves in as participants, which is much appreciated. So basic agenda today, always starting with agenda bashing, then we've got a review of some action items uh, that, that folks said, said they were planning on working on from last week. Uh, just want to see where those stand. Um, then you know, we've got a review of development activity with Frederick and Kyle, um, plus whoever else has been working on things. I think we got some interesting stuff that John pushed, but he didn't want to talk about it until next week. He wanted to give people a chance to look through it. Um, we got a review of the use case mapping um, with Prem and Fabian and John. We still have sort of an outstanding question around meeting time planning. And then in the conceptual review, we had a bunch of questions that were added to the agenda. Were these you, Mike? Yes, I added that uh, conceptual Great. question. Thank you. That, that's very helpful, actually. Um, wanted to make sure credit went where credit was due. And so in addition to sort of the various other things that were there um, in terms of collateral that we can you know, look at however folks find useful, I, I did add, you know, I had a conversation already with Mike where we talked about sort of a VPN gateway case. So I added some collateral for that. And then I attempted to answer some of the questions that you had posed, Mike. Um, so we could take a look at that if folks want to as well. So anything else that folks feel need to be on the agenda? Alrighty then, let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, so you know, first, do please add yourself to the attendees. We, I know we got people who are currently arriving and I'll stick the link to the agenda in the chat again for the new folks who are just getting here. Um, makes it easy to keep track of who's around. So AI review. So on code activity, um, I think you, you had hoped, Kyle, that you would have some CRD stuff out as a PR. And yes. I have no happy news there. Yeah, definitely. So I did. I pushed out multiple versions of 54, uh, PR 54, which is the, uh, the CRD patch as well. Cool. So yeah, so that I, I'd love to get some feedback on that. Um, you know, I, at this point, it would be, I, I put a but. you know, it's the, the problem. I, I love I love vendoring in Go, but it makes code reviews interesting because when you pull in new dependencies, you know the the patch looks gigantic as it as it pulls. Yeah, in. I I also find that challenging personally. Um, yeah, and it's, it, it's it, yeah, it, right, exactly. It is what it is. So so what I did, I, I tried to at least you know put some comments in maybe to aid in review for people who want to take a look at that patch. So um, cool. I, I definitely will be available today if. Uh, you know, Frederick, I don't know if you want to sync up maybe later today if you have some time on that, and, and I'm, I'm happy to do that if you want as well. Yeah, that'll work. Cool. And I presume that'll be on the IRC channel then? Definitely, yep. Pod Network Service Mesh, cool. Um, a lot of fun stuff happens on Pod Network Service Mesh. I recommend it highly. It does. <clears throat> so, cool. So um, that's actually excellent news. So we've got that out, um, you know, in the process of review. Do you want to talk a little bit about what the CRD pull request is doing? Um, I know some people are familiar with CRDs and how we're looking to use them here, and some may be less familiar. Right. So it's so we've decided that, well, at least that, that's what this patch proposes, and, and it would be great to get feedback. But what we decided is we're going to implement um, we're going to implement both network services and and uh, network service endpoints as custom resource definitions. And the beauty of that is we get to utilize all uh, kubectl and the Kubernetes uh, database and everything on the back end. And so what the patch does is it allows us to take our, our protobuf file, which we already have, and that generates a bunch of Go code. Then we, then we use the Kubernetes code generator. So we just create a types.go file with our CRD definitions, which utilizes the generated Go file from the protobuf file um, in as far as um, essentially the, the schema for us. So it's pretty slick. The rest of the code is mostly all auto-generated. Um, then I created a new plugin that, that essentially um, is able to run the, the backend informer for this as well. <clears throat> cool. No, that, that, that's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's good work. Cool. Uh, so Frederick, you had had some hope of, of poking, or rather Kyle had some hope that you would poke it in, in cluster off this week. Um, I, I don't recall you being here to commit yourself to it. I'm just curious if anything happened there. I'm currently working on that at uh, this point. So uh, I got uh, sidetracked with a couple other tasks from uh, my day-to-day -day work. So I didn't get to dive in as deeply as I, as I want. But uh, what I do have is I've already set up a, a test cluster. And I'm 
going to create a uh, a couple jobs that and a couple sample applications designed specifically to test the boundaries of uh, of the uh, in cluster authentication. Now, specifically, there's I'm expecting there to be at least uh, two. I guess you would say. Uh, roles. One of them would just be like a standard role, which I assume would have limited uh, uh, access to change things in the API. And then I'm expecting that I need to work out how is it possible to gain privileged uh, access in order to uh, in order to make changes. And so we'll need to work out as to how much how much how many privileges do we need, and work out what's the proper way to expose that if there's such a way. If there isn't then what we'll need to do is we'll need to create credentials out of band and then we'll have to inject them into into Kubernetes. And there's a number of ways we could do that. Uh, and so so we have a path to, to make it happen regardless. But best case scenario is cluster authentication with uh, something in the pod spec saying what roles we want to attach to it. And then we should be good from there. So I'll have more on this next week. Cool. All right. <coughs> awesome. I've, I've already stuck something in the action planning for coming week under development there. So cool. Uh, use cases. So Prem, you were going to update the BGP VPN sequence diagram based on feedback? Right. Right. So I did update it. And uh, what happened? Uh, I mean, I have updated based on the feedback, but I'm also working on um, looking at the distributed VPN, whatever we discussed face-to-face, uh, uh, -face, trying to see um, what, are, what would be the uh, uh, issues in case if we fit in the uh, BGP VPN into the uh, distributed uh, uh, bridge concept. So that's what I'm currently working on. And I've also captured uh, the pros and cons between the two approaches. Uh, so th that's the status of the uh, update. Yep. So that's that's cool. So it, we'll probably talk a little bit more about that when we get to the use case uh, review section. Sure. Yeah. Um, and yep, then. Yep. Sounds like, I know you and I had the opportunity because I was speaking in San Jose to sit down and walk through the distributed bridge uh, deck. Right. The distributed CNFs. It right. sounds like you found that helpful. It may be something we decide to review in the conceptual review section uh, today as well. Sure. Cool. Yep. And then, John, did you get uh, sequence diagrams added to your use cases? I did, with some help from Prem. I've got a couple in there that probably need, <laughs> need quite a lot of input, but enough there to sort of chat about, I think. Hopefully. Okay, cool, cool. So we'll get to that in the use case doc section. Perfect. <laughs> and then, uh, Chris, I think you already dropped me a note saying you hadn't quite gotten to the day in the life of a packet. Um, uh, yeah, so um, as I mentioned, I, I would like to get a, just a better idea of the use cases so I'd understand exactly where, you know, packets are flowing through what. Also, as mentioned, get the uh, the definitions down straight, because I think I heard last week uh, overlay, underlay, different end caps and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can see how you, 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 I can see how that would be confusing. So hopefully we'll either pick some up in the conceptual review or I'd be yes. happy to make some time next week to sit down with you and talk you through whatever would be helpful. Okay, um, absolutely, yep. I had a good conversation like that with Mike this week that was, at least I found highly productive. Um, so, cool. Very good, I'll get on your calendar, thanks. Awesome. Um, okay, so review of developer activity. Other than the stuff we've already mentioned on CRD poll and, and cluster auth, is there anything else you guys would like to like? Well, I mean, so, so Ed, this is something you and I were talking about. So I think another area is, is you know, just testing in general. And uh, Frederick, I think you kind of brought this up with what you were discussing earlier, but I think that's kind of the next area that I kind of started to look at um, mm -hmm. post CRD is is, uh, is doing a bit more testing on some of the existing stuff we have. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And, and it's something I've been poking at a little bit too, as I'm, I'm sort of looking at doing uh, a proper device plugin. Uh, plugin. I'm, I'm sort of discovering some interesting and useful patterns. It turns out that, that if you more consider this plugin framework, that it becomes easy to write a test plugin that just exercises your plugin and then checks to make sure that the plugin is doing the right thing as part of its activity. So hopefully I'll have a pattern that I can show uh, next week. So one thing we're going to probably run into in the uh, future is 
when we want to test functionality that requires a Kubernetes cluster to be available, um, I think that we're going to run into limitations with Travis and Circle CI and so on. So we need to work out um, a long-term test strategy as well for uh, for the integration uh, tests. That that's definitely true, and I actually so Ed hooked me up with some of the the uh, the CI/CD testing folks from CNCF. Uh, I, I have an action item kind of to follow up with them because they they are they are actually looking into this um, you know for things beyond NSM as well. Uh, so Frederick, I can definitely pull you into that as well if you'd like if you'd like me to. Yeah, that'd be a that'd be a good thing to do because I mean, for a start, the Kubernetes community has to do this testing themselves yes. at this point, and if you know, we're there's also some work that I've been doing, uh, not part of CNCF but part of the Linux Foundation, uh, so I guess a step higher, which may be able to help a little bit with some of this stuff as well. So I think it'd be good to get in for for me to get into that because it'll help it'll help me and outside of the network service mesh and in the couple other projects that I'm working on as well. So perfect. I'll, I'll loop you into that as well. Cool. So this is, this is good. This is all goodness. Um, anyone else have anything around developer activities that they're uh, thinking of for next week um, or other sorts of things they want to sort of focus on? Cool, then I'm inclined to turn this over to Prem. Do you want to drive Prem or shall I continue driving the use case doc? I'm fine either way. Uh, yes, you can probably uh, drive it. Okay, cool. So use case doc. <clears throat> Just let me know where you'd like me to um, Yeah, so, so on the communication overflow, uh, I'm trying to capture uh, the use cases that have been uh, discussed. So I've added the distributed uh, uh, bridge use case also because I intend to use it in the L3 VPN uh, uh, or the BGP VPN use case. <coughs> yes, um, so we can scroll down. Uh, cool. We can scroll down to the top. Of the okay. So we discussed about it uh, last week. Further down. Yep. Further down. Uh, next cool. page. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Next page. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Next page, please. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Right. Here. Uh, Don't take care of, yeah. please. I am gonna. Are you looking for the the sequence diagram here? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, he, I had uh, mentioned uh, earlier that there can be two approaches. One is uh, you can probably set up on demand. Um, so that is where this use case is going to come. Um, the other uh, uh, scenario would essentially be uh, there's a full mesh between the uh, compute nodes. Um, in that case, uh, what happens is. There is a full mesh uh, VXLAN that is created between the uh, between the uh, uh, various uh, nodes, and then you would have the bridge uh, pod exposing those channels. That's going to be the second mo model. But here, uh, the last week, uh, what we discussed was I was a bit confused on whether it's going to be VXLAN channel or L2. Uh, so it's, it is VXLAN channel that would be set up by network service mesh a priori, and then once that happens, uh, the pod would essentially uh, be exposing the uh, uh, L2 channel. And then um, uh, the um, network uh, service mesh manager would essentially publish this L2 endpoints onto the uh, API server. And then whenever other pod wants to have a communication with that of the uh, pod at node one, it would essentially use the uh, uh, L2 channel to uh, talk to it. Um, so uh, I also see a bit of parallel uh, with that of the VPN gateway. We can probably discuss more when we get into the VPN gateway, yeah. right? Um, so again, just uh, for people who joined uh, uh, um, new to this call, um, so the, this particular use case is essentially to uh, create a, a network uh, a virtualization uh, for a typical data center. Uh, the idea is you would have uh, the MPLS uh, or BGP uh, VPN terminating on your uh, uh, PE slash TC gateway, uh, and then uh, what happens is you would have Pods uh, uh, of different tenants being hosted on different nodes. Um, so for for the uh, for the internal traffic as well as the bump traffic, there will be a VXLAN mesh between all the nodes that is set up, and then there would be another MPLS over GRE tunnel that would essentially be set with that of the DC gateway, which would essentially carry the LSPs all the way up to that of the uh, nodes. Uh, this is exclusively uh, this channel is essentially meant for the pods to talk with 
the uh, external world as well as uh, talk to uh, sites which are uh, present uh, across that's the use case and then as part of the use case uh, the uh, first sequence diagram is all about uh, how how, the, how would the uh, uh, channel look like um, so network if you uh, if you have gone through the if you have gone through the uh, uh, intro document as well as uh, other documents it has uh, clearly mentioned that uh the network service mesh should essentially set up the uh, uh, vxlan channel uh, vxlan it should be tunnels uh, sorry it should not be channels so vxlan channel uh, would be tunnel um, and then the parts would essentially it can expose l2 or any other depending upon their capability uh, this can be thought of as uh, 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 sitting on or inside the vxlan tunnel so this would be essentially within the data center and then the next uh, is essentially the connection between the nodes to that of the dc gateway again uh, the assumption is that the uh, uh, gre tunnels would be set between the nodes and then the dc gateway and then it's essentially the mpls channel or the ls if that run all the way from that of the dc gateway to this nodes um, so this is more like a point to point scenario but uh, one other scenario can be uh, uh, the distributed uh, 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 bridge concept uh, which um, Ed had uh, brought in. I haven't uh, populated it because I see some gaps in that. Uh, I'm uh, still working on it, uh, so I'll populate it uh, uh, later. Uh, uh, later this the next week, um, and we can also probably discuss more about uh, uh, during the scenario discussion. So that's the update with respect to the to the of the uh, use case document. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. So thank you. Uh, I appreciate that update, and it's it's good that you went through and updated the sequence diagrams. And if, if oh, folks great. are sort of more interested in the distributed, you know, distributed CNF or distributed bridge case, we can talk about that in sort of the conceptual review section later on. Now then, John, I think you also had updated some sequence diagrams in the case you were talking about. Uh, was there some place you do you want to drive, or would you like me to go someplace in particular to talk to them? Or? No, but I trust you're driving Ed implicitly. You're doing a great job. Okay. <laughs> so I copied, um, you know friends diagrams and got some input from him so i did two sequence diagrams one was more sort of the first one which you're highlighting here which is great is bringing up um a new resource mm -hmm. and so the first thing is the pod says to network service mesh i'm requiring a new a new channel it talks to the api server talks to the device plugin daemon set Ask for a resource, triggers instantiation of ask for ask for a new network namespace in the pod from the device plugin, which then triggers instantiation of a new security CNF. Or oh, it could be any CNF. This is just for this case. I mean, it's anything. And then we inject the CNF into the container of the pod, which is then running. So you can imagine this being a security VNF. It could be a um, VXLAN gateway or VTAP or anything else we want to put in there. It gives us the ability to stick network resources into mm -hmm. pods on demand. Does this make sense, everybody? I mean, I, I kind of went through this, and I'm not sure I've got it right, but you know, it's no well, way. it makes a certain amount of sense because I mean, the, the effectively what, what you're saying is that you have a use case here, and you were sort of clear about the use case. You have a use case here where you would like to be able to um, inject a new network namespace into the pod and inject a security container into the pod, a, a security CNF container into the pod. And that's sort of an interesting use case. And there's a lot of interesting discussion you can have about who should be doing what, where, and when in this process. Yes. Um, and I, I think you were pretty clear about that. This is certainly one way to, to look at how to do that. And um, so, I mean, th this is interesting. Do we have other folks on the call who are sort of interested in this inject a security CNF container into the pod use case? Because I would love to get commentary from people who have a similar use case. I seem to recall that that is an approach that IBM has taken with other projects in the past. And uh, I believe that that's an approach that should, um, that should work. So it's definitely one that we should, uh, that we should take a look at. Yeah, I posted the code yesterday, uh, that thing I wrote up, there's a bunch of links to um, a couple of repos that have a working example. 
it doesn't use network service mesh. So I probably need to um, work with um, Kyle and um, Fred about how to do this. Yeah, so I mean, that, 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 that's awesome. I think that that's awesome. And I, I appreciate you putting the code up. That helps everybody. And, and you're, you're interested in working with Kyle and Fred on this. Um, the, the one interesting thing, and I, I know you're aware of this because we've known each other for a while. We're all in the same is there, there is a trade off to having a CNF per pod versus, say, a CNF on a given node. And there are definitely times when that trade off is worth it. Um, you know, so I, I think both use cases are going to be of interest. Yeah, I've, I've talked to a bunch of um, customers and people and, you know, the, the attraction, the positive feedback is mainly around it makes the CNFs atomic with the pod, which is a mm -hmm. standard a Kubernetes design pattern. I don't have to worry about um, additional resources when I bring up a pod. It's the resources are there with the pod. Oh, yeah. No, I, I can absolutely see the cases where that's an attractive way to do deployment. Totally. However, I think the, the, the negative side is it, it does make the pod a little more heavyweight. So yeah, It absolutely does. And, and depending on, on how much work you're looking to do, um, I mean, you're, you're, you're well aware, and I think a lot of people on the call are well aware of the, the trade-offs in terms of when you're really doing bit banging data plane work, um, you know, moving all of that, you know, distributing all of that to a bunch of different CNFs versus putting it into a CNF that can kidnap some number of cores. But, you know, the, the truth of the matter is I absolutely see the use case. Um, I just think we need to support both. And the, the second sequence diagram there is really, really very simplistic. But mm -hmm. it's thinking about if I want an L3 management network mm -hmm. on top of my existing L3 Kubernetes network. Mm -hmm. I know there's a whole bunch of work being done in um, Multis and other things and whether Multis is the right way of doing it or whether network service mesh is the right way of doing it, I think mm -hmm. is another interesting discussion because there is so many use cases for having this, I, I won't use the word overlay, Chris, just to... <laughs> <laughs> Having this additional, <laughs> having this additional parallel network that's used to um, manage either network resources or other resources mm -hmm. from security guys and from management guys, they like having this so this DevOps slash SecOps network that's separate from the the traffic network. Yeah, and and I I, I think I've also got some, something that that I sort of put together on VPN gateways that moves in this direction as well. Um, because I, my suspicion is that often what is on the other side of that thing um, for the management network is some kind of a VPN thing that you're being gated to. Um, yes. and, and so I mean, this gets to sort of a really central point, which is um, it is almost never the case that what you actually want is a network. It is almost always the case that what you want is a network service. Um, you know, for example, in the, the case of a, of a management interface, you don't really want it plugged into some blimp linking subnet because then you've got to go manage that and figure out how to get what you really want in some out of band way. What you really want is for it to connect to, for example, your VPN gateway service, right? Which does all kinds of nice things for you, including backhauling you to various other places. So, no, this is good. This is good. I appreciate it. Thank you. Once again, it's fairly simplistic. I actually put together, so earliest morning, just following um, mm -hmm. Prem's L2 overlay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. one, which I, I think it works the same way. It's just a. I think we just need to think of how do we manage <coughs> these multiple different resources or multiple different meshes. I'm not sure yeah. that's the right word. Well, and, and the thing is, I, I think part of what's helpful here is I, I've had some conversations with people, and we all think at different levels of most comfortably at different levels of abstraction versus concreteness. Um, and and so at a very abstract level, it's exactly the same pattern everywhere, right? Um, but the concreteness is very helpful running through examples and showing the same pattern as it applies in different environments. So this is very helpful. Thank you. So if people can look at it and give comments, I'm more than happy to expand, update, change, modify, so et cetera. So awesome. To help. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. So anything else on use cases at this particular moment on the use case document? Um, are there use cases that folks want to stand up and raise their hand to add? Okay, cool. Then um, 
getting back to the agenda, I think the next item we had up was meeting time planning. Um, there had been a, a point raised that having a meeting on Friday um, is problematic for certain parts of the world um, because Friday is part of the weekend for certain portions of the world. And I think where we had left it was, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm a little vague here, was that, that Prem was going to send out another doodle and that Mike was going to find people for whom this was concretely a problem to speak up. Um, did either yeah. of you? Yeah, so I have, uh, so uh, I'll probably, I'm creating a form. Uh, I, sorry, I couldn't send the uh, link no, to the no, group. No, so no, no, we're all volunteers here. So I, I appreciate all the work. Everybody's yeah. So, so uh, the form would essentially be, uh, I, I was looking to ask for the time zone as well as the, uh, the uh, uh, time slot that would be uh, useful for, uh, or, or that would be suitable for all. So, with, um, so I'll probably send it uh, today. Many thanks. Uh, it would be a Google form, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Um, Just additional... And Mike, yeah. are you able to, to, to find folks who want to participate for whom this is concretely a problem? I prodded somebody to look at the existing Doodle poll, and I see this person did not add anything to it. Um, I will continue to try to raise awareness of this work and see what the interest is. Um, Hi, Chris. We should talk sometime. Um, and um, that's all I got right now. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Awesome. So, Ed, uh, you being the captain of the ship, uh, I want probably some time uh, that would suit you so that I'll probably put that in the form, uh, the Google form. So, the time that suits you, the time you would be available. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate your over, over characterization of the fact that I run a fine meeting. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's challenging because I do know, I believe we have participants from Europe already, um, as well as North America. And, and that means basically mornings in North America, at least Pacific time mornings. Um, and most of the rest of those have been chewed up already by the other many collaborations. So it, it, it's, it's a tricky thing always to find a time that suits everyone. Um, right. So, oh, yeah, what but I think I would probably, yeah, sorry. One of the things I did want to raise, I know, George, that you have a bunch of folks um, in China who may want to participate. Um, I want to make sure that if you've got concrete people there um, who want to participate, that we make sure we roll them into this consideration as well. Yeah, I'm still working on that. That's good. Cool. As a, so, one other alternate, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, as one other thing is, if it turns out that the time zone thing is too difficult, then what we can do is we could probably alternate. Um, That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I was able to say the same. Yep. I, I I have definitely seen that work. I um as a purely personal matter, it's a miracle I make it to any regular weekly meeting. So alternating meetings confuses me, but I can get over it. So. Um, okay. Cool. So with, you've had me completely fooled with this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Awesome. So action planning for the coming week. So we already had a couple things called out for development uh, work. Or is there anything else that folks want to add to sort of developer coding activity? Uh, I don't have anything other than what was, you know, what we discussed before. So, I mean, I, hopefully we can, we can try to get the CRD patch in next yep. week. Cool. I mean, on a purely personal note, I'd like people to take a look at the thing I put out and maybe especially Frederick and Kyle and if there's any way we can integrate or overlap, it would be. So I, I've, I've scrolled a bullet here. If you could actually put a link to that, call to the code there. Uh, call sure. You, that would be massively helpful because then there's a, there's the, oh, wait, I remember someone said I should review this code. Where do I find the link thing that people did? Yes, buy? I understand. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it actually gets worse over time because we'll be asked to do 10 different things and remembering any one thing is, <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, there's, there's, there's this lovely concept in psychology called for humans called the Harad factor, um, which I'm very fond of. It's the number of things that you can perceive um, count of without actually counting. So like if I threw three pennies down on a desk, most people can perceive that it's three. If I throw 13 pennies down on the desk, most people can't perceive that it's 13 without counting them. 
And I, I think most people can't manage more than their Harad factor of stuff going on at once. Cool. Awesome. So use case mapping. Um, Prem, um, John, you know, John, others. Uh, so, uh, hmm? he, yeah, I'll probably try to put in the distributed, uh, whatever uh, that's applicable I'll put, and I'll probably put uh, a separate section as uh, gaps or uh, to be decided. Okay, cool. Anyone else? If I get feedback, I'll update things. So. Okay, thank you. Cool. Awesome. All right, so anything else on action planning for the coming week? Awesome. So for conceptual review, we, we've got a, a whole laundry list of choices here. Um, you know, in particular, you know, everyone I think has been through the, we've been through the intro and there's the video there. Um, there's stuff talking about how hardware interfaces work um, because it's fairly straightforward, but it, it helps to see it. Um, the distributed bridge, sort of distributed CNFs, I think there's probably a lot of interest in. Uh, the VPN gateway case is one that came up this week in talking to Mike. And then Mike was kind enough to provide us with a bunch of questions and I provided um, a really, I made an attempt to provide some answers to them um, in a way that could be referenced. Um, do folks have opinions as to how they would like to proceed? We've got about 25 minutes left. Don't all speak at once. So one thing I wanna probably, it's a generic question, um, but probably thought if uh, we can see if network mesh can fall. Um, so if you look at the uh, typical, uh, uh, the overlay underlay concept, so you have full mesh uh, between the nodes. So that's a typical way to build it. But is there a way to optimize the uh, uh, whole uh, uh, VXLAN mesh? Um, just thoughts on how we can uh, optimize, because it's, it's, let's assume that you have like hundreds of nodes, then imagine building a, a full mesh uh, between these nodes. Uh, it will increase as the number of nodes increases. Any thoughts on optimizing that? I, I have some general ideas there. Um, you know, I have some general ideas there. There, there are trade-offs, of course. Uh, it, it sounds like you'd kind of like to start with the distributed bridge domain stuff, and then we can um, we can sort of, of jump from there. Uh, does that sound sure? Okay, cool. And I, I do yep. want to mention in the last, you know, at the very latest in the last ten, you know, five ten minutes, we go back to Mike's questions because he put effort into constructing them. Um, and, and so trying to talk through them, I think, is important. I, I, I like to reward effort with actual feedback. So um, cool. So this is the distributed bridge domain deck. I don't remember how much of this I animated. God help us all. So this is literally, there's a class of things where your, your container, your, your cloud native network functions are actually distributed across a bunch of different nodes. They aren't actually living in one central place. And, and, and it's a generic class of things. And I tend to think abstractly, so I think about it as a generic class of things. But the truth is there's one that almost everybody's familiar with, which is distributed bridge domains, right? And so I figured if I talk through that, um, it will sort of show the pattern for how you would handle distributed CNFs in general. I'm gonna skip past the getting the most out of this presentation. This is in case I'm ever presenting it in video, people can find other decks. So let, let's look at what the actual problem is here. Um, and I'm gonna try and animate this, God help us all. Hang on a second. Can everyone see um, the, the presentation? Yep. Cool. So the, the, the general problem is you've got a bunch of pods on a bunch of nodes, and they of course have their normal K8s networking in the normal way, they've got an interface for that. But you'd also like to be able to connect them to distributed bridge domains, right? So some distributed bridge domain zero, <coughs> some distributed bridge domain one, not everybody's connected to every bridge domain. Some people are connected to more than one bridge domain. But this is a sort of very common kind of problem that, that people have for a variety of reasons. And often you will implement this with VXLAN for tunneling, but quite frankly, um, you know, that's not, you know, whatever works for whoever is providing the distributed bridge domain CNF. So to look at this from an NSM point of view, you, you start by defining a network service for your bridge domain zero. Um, and then you deploy some set of pods or daemon sets that implement bridge, you know, bridge domain zero and you match across them using labels, um, you know, selectors on one side and labels on the other. 
And let's say just for the sake of argument, this is the full mesh case, and we'll get back to your partial mesh in a moment. Um, Prem, in the full mesh case, you just deploy a, a daemon set of BR0 pods across every node. Right. That's the simple case. And then the, the question is, okay, how do you actually get hooked up if you're a pod who wants connection to distributed bridge domain zero? And it's fairly straightforward. You know, every, you know, on every node, there is a BR0 pod. It exposes a channel for that service to the NSM, right? Then, you know, you update network service endpoints in the API server so people can find you. Then, you know, the pod makes a request for a connection to the NSM to the BR0 service. Um, and it requests that connection with some parameters that indicate that it prefers local affinity. In other words, please connect me to an implementation of this network service on the same node, if at all possible. The NSM, taking that into account and not already knowing that it has a local BR0 pod, doesn't really have to consult the API server in that case. So it simply makes a request to the BR0 pod for the connection, accept connection, you inject the interface or memf or vhost user or whatever into the VR0 pod for the pod that's seeking to connect. And then you inject on the other end the memf, vhost user, et cetera, into that pod and tell it that it actually has that connection. And at that point, you've got something going through your data plane that with that interface, pod zero, you know, the pod talks to the VR0 pod locally on your node. Um, so, uh, mm -hmm. I had a couple of questions here. Uh, sure. Um, uh, so, the first one, the exposed channel, let's assume that's the L2 channel, right? Now, uh, uh, let's assume that uh, the pods uh, of different tenants are being hosted, right? Mm -hmm. So, do you intend to see that you will create uh, a bridge domain for each uh, uh, multi tenant, uh, for each tenant? Well, so, so in order to keep each, each bridge domain is an L2 service, right? And the L2 service it provides is bridging for other things right. to the same domain. So if I had two different tenants and they wanted two different bridge domains, those are two different network services. Mm -hmm. Okay. Make sense? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you could even, you could even imagine a situation and I sort of showed that a little bit here originally where, you know, let's just say the, 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 what the far left node is tenant one, the far right node is tenant two. And for some strange reason, they agree they should have something that talks to both bridge domains. Um, that kind of thing is supportable here. Um, you know, mm -hmm. but if you just want strict separation, then you really have different bridge domains. Sure. And also, uh, you would also have a model wherein the bridge domains are connected to a router so that they can uh, talk via the router. Uh, that's entirely up to those bridge domains requesting. Okay. You know, if, if they want to go and 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 step by step build themselves for a you know with something of that nature, what you're really talking about is those bridge domains having a connection to a network service that does something for them, whether it's as simple right. as a okay. or more complicated like a VPN gateway. Um, you know that that's their business, not ours. Sure. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we, we don't need to reinvent the neutron model here at the, the high level. We just have to be able to support it for the people who really, really want it. Um, so <clears throat> distributed bridge domaining. So you've got a bunch of nodes. They have BR0 pods. Um, effectively, <coughs> those pods are responsible for standing up the VX split tunnels between each other because that's how they provide the network service they want. So the NSM is actually not involved in this at all um, because it's just connecting pods to CNFs. Now, the tunnels could be normal Kubernetes net, you know, over the normal Kubernetes networking. They could be over some other network service that's requested by the BR0 pods, right? That's up to whoever has put that together, the distributed bridge together. And then the BR0 pods coordinate with each other um, using whatever mechanism the implementer of the BR0 pods decided they were using. It could be a controller. It could be used some other mechanism. Um, you know, it could be an SDN. They could be talking BGP for EVPN. Um, that's really the problem of the person who is deploying the distributed CNF. Um, so it, the, the choice of that is outside of the NSM scope. Its whole purpose in life is to hook up pods to the network service that is BR0. Um, now, one other thing I will point out here, this gets to your fully meshed versus non-fully meshed case, uh, Prem. In the event that say on node one, I had no BR0 pod, either because I chose not to deploy one there 
or because um, for some reason it has had an accident, it is not present, um, and for some reason hasn't been respawned. But if for whatever reason there's not a BR0 on node one, when a pod on node one requests access to the BR0 network service, the NSM will naturally create some kind of a point-to-point -point link to one of the BR0 pods elsewhere. Make sense? Right. And so you'll basically, <coughs> there's a cost because that means that any bridging has to hairpin through wherever the BR0 pod is remotely, but it may be worth it to you to not deploy a BR0 on all of a hundred of hundreds of your nodes simply because you know, that's expensive and to in some cases be backhauling. Um, and in fact, if you wanted to, because we have pod affinity available, where you can essentially say, please deploy my pod near another pod, you could sort of put your thumb on the scale in terms of scheduling of your workload pods to encourage them to be on a node that has a BR0 pod running. But everything still works if you don't. And by the way, neither the pod requesting a connection to the BR0 network service, nor the pod providing it, actually know jack shit about whether or not that, that connection is, re, is local and remote or being backhauled to some other node. It's just not their business. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. Uh, do other folks have questions on this? Um, I, I, I'm sure there's something I've not been terribly clear about or some corner that I've forgotten. Does it make sense to folks? So I, I mean, it makes sense to me. I've been following the discussion here. Well, and that's encouraging. You, you sort of have a lot of experience with distributed bridge domains in your past. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious if if anyone else, you know, if it's if you know, I, I think it's like you said. Is there any? If it's not clear to someone else, it, it you know, it, we should make sure it's clear to most of the people on the call. I think. Agreed. Did that help answer your question, Prem? <coughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it has, again, the nice convenience. That nobody knows or cares whether or not you've got a full mesh or not. That's not actually any of the pods involves business. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and the advantage you get here is, uh, at least uh, the advantage you get from Kubernetes is this, this is a pod and uh, you can probably schedule it on demand and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this makes uh, it much more easier in a, uh, when you compare with a typical uh, VM world or non-Kubernetes world. Yeah, and one other thing I will point out, because I know we have some people in the, the broader community who want to do this, there's no reason that you have to have a pod for a bridge domain. So if you're someone who's deploying something that is smart enough to handle many, many bridge domains, it's effectively just exposing many network services, and that can work too, right? So you could always have something that is a you know, a BR zero through N pod that exposes a bunch of bridge domains as separate network services. So, so Ed, I kind of, I kind of get it. Mm -hmm. How do you connect applications into it? So if I have a, mm -hmm. a worker node pod that wants to connect into the dispute bridge domain, how do I do that? Yeah. So, I mean, that's very much this picture. Um, you know, basically, and it works pretty much like anything you want to connect to distribute connect to at all. So if I've got a pod here on the right, um, you know, so first of all, the BR zero pod exposes the channel saying, okay, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm an endpoint for this network service for the BR zero network service. Um, then the pod on the right is someone who wants to connect to the BR zero network service, right? Mm -hmm. It just makes a request. And as part of that request, because keep in mind for these requests, we can define our own gRPC. So we're in the process of doing that in the, in the coding activity. One of the things you probably want to be able to do is express a request for local affinity. In other words, please connect me to the instance of this on the same node, if at all possible. Mm -hmm. So having expressed that, you know, request a connection to the service and request a local affinity preference, the NSM, knowing that it has something it can satisfy the local affinity preference with, goes ahead and does the normal setting up of a connection to the BR0 pod. Requests a connection, the BR0 pod says sure, you inject an interface, you know, MemIF, fee host user, et cetera, for that connection into the BR0 pod. The NSM injects the corresponding interface into the requesting pod and you know, closes off the accept connection. And at that point, 
you have an interface between the pod and the BR0 pod locally, like a VETH or something like that, right? So how did you do it remotely? So if, if, the, if the BR0 pod was not on the same mm -hmm. node as the pod? So if it's not on the same node as a pod, <coughs> um, it looks like, let me go jump back quickly, slightly different deck. Um, if, it, if it's remotely, then it's like connecting to any other remote network service, right? Uh, well, hang on. Google is thinking thoughts. Clearly lots of thoughts. So the generic case for any network service that is remote, come on. is roughly this one. So if I'm connecting to something that's remote, so if you just think in this picture that the pod on the left is your BR0 pod, it happens to be on a different node. You know, it exposes okay. the, end, the endpoint gets advertised. You get a request a connection. If you could imagine the pod saying, please, if at all possible, give me a local affinity connection. If local NSM realizes he can't do that, so he figures out where he can find a network service endpoint for BR0, Service request the connection, and it looks very similar. It's just that you got the the peering between two NSMs, and the connections. What is the connection? So locally, the connection from the pod is to whatever your data plane is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, over a local interface, and then your data plane will have been provisioned by the NSM to do whatever it agreed with the remote NSM, whether that's VXLAN, GRE, whatever the fuck. Right, not our problem. Um, they, they've come to some agreement between themselves in terms of what they prefer and what they support. Make sense? Yeah, let me think about it. It's, I'm still trying to map it into Kubernetes, so. <laughs> and, and it's, it sounds like what we're saying is that mm -hmm. the pod requesting the BR0 connection doesn't He's, if he doesn't request local affinity, then mm -hmm. he's saying he doesn't care where it is. So the network service manager is up to him to figure out yep. where the, which BR0 pod to do. And in turn, instead of requesting a direct BR0 qu uh, question, building the, the tunnel through which that layer two is going to be tunneled, like you say, whether it's GRE or VXLAN or whatever. Th that's pretty much what we're saying. So the interface the sequence of actions is pretty much the same between an NSM and a pod. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it's pretty much the same. You know, if the if you either don't request local affinity or the NSM simply can't provide it to you because nobody has run a BR0 pod locally, then, you know, it will automatically find some way to get you connected to that BR0 pod by, you know, finding a peer NSM and then programming whatever the agreed tunneling is via your data plane. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And so effectively, the po either way, the pod gets a point to point tunnel to somebody who is providing the distributed bridge domain service. Um, and then the distributed bridge domain figures out how it wants to handle the sort of point to multi point bridging behavior. I, I think that's a very, very succinct rephrasing of, of, of the idea, Tom. I appreciate it. The only difference is the pa packets will have less latency and perhaps better performance because they won't be, but because the network service manager hopefully will be able to um, get the best quality service we don't. Maybe sometime in the future we'll have to talk about SLAs and all that, but uh, this is sufficient to work. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the idea is you, know, you can't always get what you want, but, some, but if you try sometimes, you get what you need. So clearly the ideal is to be able to get a local BR0 pod in this case, um, or at least from the pod's point of view, that's the ideal. Maybe from the guy who's not wanting to burn hundreds of instances of BR0 where he may not need it, it may not be ideal. But from the pod's point of view, that's ideal. And you know, if, if we can do that for them, then we do. And, and if they can't get that, then they get at least something that provides the network service they asked for. Make sense? Cool. So I'd actually like to drop back. We've got about seven minutes left. And uh, Mike was kind enough to provide a bunch of really good questions. And I, I made an attempt to answer them. Um, and, and I think sort of like the, the thing that really jumped out at me, Mike, was the who is agreeing with whom about what. 
Um, and so I, I sort of phrased the deck that way, but you asked a lot of sort of granular questions in there that were also very helpful. Um, shall we dive into that? Okay, sure. Cool. So I didn't know about this <laughs> until the meeting started, so I've only had a chance to skim it. In uh, fairness, it's only existed for about 30 minutes before the meeting started. Okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I had no expectation you would have seen it. This was literally me, literally me going to do the agenda, realizing there were good questions and wanting to try and, and provide good answers. Okay. So um, I have a bit of a reaction um, based, again, on just the quick uh, skim that I've done so far. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, you know, we, um, that it's, it's kind of interesting. You, you managed to not show in either of the agreements that, that I teased out of you. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sorry I didn't quite answer the question you wanted to answer. Let's no, no, it's, it's revealing, right? Because it's, it's telling me that you're focusing on different issues than, um, than I think need to be explained up front um, okay. and at, no, the top, at the top of the presentation about this whole idea. Mm -hmm. um, so the two agreements, right, that we talked about was the agreement between the application level container mm -hmm. of containers, right? So we talked about the example of a web server and a web client. There's sure. an agreement between them, um, which is that they are communicating via TCP, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and that they, uh, and there's a local agreement I see there's several agreements. I'll just, I'll just tick them off, right? There's a local agreement between each of those bits of application and the kernel. Uh, we focused on the, uh, the web server case, who has agreed with the kernel that the server is going to talk to the kernel in terms of listen and accept. Um, and then there is the agreement uh, across the network between the web server and the web client, uh, which is that they're going to talk to each other with TCP. Um, and so let me try to map that into what you did say. Here's, here's the thing, here's the thing I'll suggest to you. A lot of those agreements are actually not agreements that either the app or the client gives a shit about. They're, they're just, they're, they're the way things happen to be done. I, I would actually suggest that the agreement between the web server and the web client is that if the web client sends a stream of bytes towards the web server, the web server will interpret them in some particular way and send a stream, stream of bytes back to it. The fact that they happen to be using TCP it's sort of kind of incidental. It just happens to be the way that you send streams of bytes between two, two entities. And so, so I would say- The streaming that's actually important, the payload is what matters, not the underlay. In this case, the underlay would be the TCP socket. So I would say this is a matter of layers. So, um, or maybe a scopes. So um, the agreement between the application code and the kernel um, is a little more like what you said. Um, they use the kernel's interface for streams over the network. Yep. Um, yep. But the, the, there is another agreement, I think, between the network peers that is important here. Okay. Um, right, because these things are not developed by the same shop, right? Um, and they're not deployed or operated by the same shop. And so different organizations across the world have, you know, agree that web servers and web clients are going to talk to each other via TCP. And it's very specific that it is TCP that they're going to talk to each other by yeah, over the network. That's actually not so true. I mean, we have a lot of web traffic right now that happens over quick, for example, right? The TCP um, incidental underlay that's negotiated between the kernels. Um, it's not actually in any way, shape or form the concern of the web server or the web app of the web client. Neither of those actually care. Um, again, yes or no. I would agree with that as a statement about the code in the client. However, there is somebody who has chosen to run this code and expect it to have some effect on the wider world. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that I would say that, that is ground. I would say that is grounded in TCP and HTTP. Um, it works and, just and as well over quick. So it works just as well over quick. So um, the world is not as simple as it was in 1990. Uh, sorry, I should say maybe 1995. Right. So um, there has been evolution, and there is a problem of how do you introduce new protocols, right? There have been several runs at introducing new protocols. Um, mm -hmm. We have Speedy, we have HTTP2, we have HTTPS, we have TLS, right? all sorts but of groovy all things. All those are actually protocols that live on top of the byte stream. 
They're not protocols that live under the byte stream. So they're not playing at the level of TCP. They're playing at the, the, the byte stream level at above. Uh, right, right. So um, I guess you have to tell me, I know we're out of time. So let me try it this way. Mm -hmm. um, there are multiple agreements in the world, okay? Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of people who have agreed that we're going to leverage TCP and the available evolution facilities built into um, there, there, there are a bunch of kernels that have agreed that we're going to, to use. No, I, no, I think it's, no, it's important to understand. It's not just the kernels that have agreed. It's the people that chose to run this application code on this kernel with the expectation I, that other people out there in the world, by looking them up, their IP address up in DNS, can reach their application code over TCP. And yes, there's some other people who are using Quick. That's an additional agreement. Okay, but there's a bunch of people who have agreed on TCP and HTTP and the various elaborations of that. I, I, but, but not because they actually care about it, because it happens to be there and it happens to be something that's universally available and universally used. The important the, point is that it's, it's an agreement because there are a bunch of people who have agreed on it. The, 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 the important distinction here is that in the case of network services, there is literally no universally accepted agreement for how we move an IP packet, how we tunnel an IP packet, or how we tunnel an, I, an Ethernet frame or an MPLS frame between two places. There are a million and one answers to that question. None of them are actually agreed. And it turns out that we, if we focus on the payload, we only have to agree link-wise between the people who are handling the underlay carriage. And, and by abstracting that away, we don't actually have to get agreement at all between the pods about how we have this conversation. And I think that's just a restatement of the existing old world, right? It's the, that's, that's network services V1, slap a V on it. I, 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 no, no, not quite. I, I do apologize. I have a hard stop at the top of the hour. Um, okay. Do make sure that we follow up. I'd be happy to talk to you either offline or in the meeting next week. Okay. Um, either way, because I think this is a very interesting conversation. Thank okay. you all for coming. It has been marvelous. I will see you guys next week, same time. Cool. Okay. Bye.